Hello, my name is Saira Fareed and I am a research fellow in infectious diseases at Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota. Today, I'm here to tell you about an article that I authored entitled Clinical Manifestations and Outcomes of Fluoroquinolone-Related Acute Interstitial Nephritis. We are well aware of a number of potential adverse effects related to fluoroquinolone use, including peripheral neuropathy, tendinopathy, neuropsychiatric effects, and QT prolongation. But the potential nephrotoxicity related to fluoroquinolone use is infrequent and not well recognized. And despite the extensive use of fluoroquinolone for over 20 years, data on the association of fluoroquinolone and acute interstitial nephritis is limited largely to case reports. So we felt it was necessary to explore this potential adverse effect. We reviewed all cases of biopsy-proven interstitial nephritis that were attributed to fluoroquinolone use at Mayo Clinic Rochester from 1993 to 2016. These cases were reviewed by an expert renal pathologist at Mayo Clinic and attributed to fluoroquinolone use by experienced nephrologists, ID physicians, and allergy immunology specialists. We identified 24 patients with biopsy-proven fluoroquinolone-related interstitial nephritis at our institution. The most commonly prescribed fluoroquinolone was ciprofloxacin, seen in 71% of our cohort and the average duration of antibiotic therapy was around seven days. The most common presentation of fluoroquinolone-related interstitial nephritis is rapid impairment of renal function within days to weeks of starting the antibiotic. Urinalysis in these cases typically show mild proteinuria, pyuria, eosinophiluria. However, peripheral eosinophilia may or may not be present with drug-induced interstitial nephritis. Interestingly, the majority of patients in our study did not have these typical manifestations. This is important for the clinicians to know so that the absence of these findings does not sway them away from considering this diagnosis. Extranal manifestations such as skin rash and fever, which we typically expect in drug-induced allergic reactions, were present in only a quarter of our patients. In fact, 17% of the patients in our cohort were completely asymptomatic. And even though 42% had hematuria at initial presentation, it was microscopic and therefore patients may not report any change in the color of their urine. Due to these non-specific clinical features, renal biopsy is often required to make a definitive diagnosis of interstitial nephritis in these cases. Kidney biopsy in all of our patients was consistent with acute interstitial nephritis characterized by interstitial inflammation with lymphocytes, plasma cells, eosinophils, lymphocytic tubulitis, and interstitial edema. The mainstay of treatment for drug-induced interstitial nephritis is, of course, stopping the culprit drug as soon as the diagnosis is suspected. Majority of our cohort recovered completely at six months after the discontinuation of fluoroquinolone therapy, with an average time to recovery of around three weeks. Steroids have been used as an adjunct therapy to reduce the interstitial fibrosis and hasten recovery. However, their, re their role remains controversial with the lack of prospective trials demonstrating efficacy. Adjunct steroid therapy was prescribed in 58% of our cohort, and there was no statistically significant difference in the time to recovery with steroid therapy compared to without steroids, as well as early versus late initiation of steroid therapy. A quarter of our patients required transient renal replacement therapy. We analyzed the relationship between oligouria or hemodialysis and the degree of renal recovery and found no statistically significant correlation. So here are some key take-home points from our paper. Fluoroquinolone-related interstitial nephritis, though infrequent, should always be considered by physicians when they see patients receiving fluoroquinolone therapy develop acute kidney injury. The timing of interstitial nephritis onset, the clinical manifestations, and the severity of kidney injury can be variable. Diagnosis can be challenging as a majority of these patients do not have the extra renal manifestations of interstitial nephritis. And hence, 
a renal biopsy may be necessary to establish the diagnosis. And finally, stopping the offending agent with or without adjunct steroid therapy leads to resolution of acute kidney injury in a majority of these patients. Thank you for listening to me, and I hope you enjoy our paper. We hope you found this presentation from the content of Mayo Clinic Proceedings valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our homepage is www.mayocliniceproceedings.org. There you will find access information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.